Via telephone, Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, Rob. How are you guys? We are well, Phil, and yourself. Living the dream. Hey, in June... You have reached that status. You've reached the status of Oprah, Madonna, Prince, LeBron, Jordan... And Rob, you're there, buddy. <laughs> I think they call that the double Mount Rush, Rushmore of, uh, of names. And then I he- keep hearing that song from my childhood. One of these things is not like the other. Which one is it? Do you know? <laughs> I'll be putting my hand up. Uh, Phil, uh, you are coming in yes, studio sir. in a couple weeks. Yes, we are. On June the 5th, I do believe, barring any surprises, John and I or John or one of us anyway would be there on June 5th. Phil, it's been a long time, man. It's now you, been a long time. you're if there's people coming into the studio, you better be one of them, Phil. I should be there then. Yeah. If if, if you request it, I will be there. If it, it's got to be at least you and John. Now come on. We can do it. All yeah. right, that's what I like Bar- to hear. Barring any surprises. And there's always a surprise that could jump up, but we should be there. You haven't been in here since we were downstairs in the dungeon, man. Last time you came in, we were were down in the dungeon. It's been a while. What's the purpose? The the intention was to come in, but, man, it's difficult on Monday mornings at 830, getting out of the house on time, and and, and our schedule. Because we normally have appointments that begin right at 930, and it takes a little bit of prep time. You know, you're talking to Rob, well, who gets here at five. <laughs> is, 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 I'm calling in at six thirty. Is June the fifth uh, anything special, Phil? Why Why are you coming in? Not that we we're looking forward to seeing you, but why are you coming in just now? Uh, on June fifth, we we just want to discuss. We had a, a our office and the Myriad's group that were part of a bigger uh, a, a bigger practice that was uh, awarded something. So we just kind of wanted to discuss that and. Uh, and then come in and, and see you guys, of course. You're not telling us what you were awarded, though, Phil. You're playing as close to the vest? Yeah. Well, no, it was Forbes Best in State, which we've been awarded multiple years in a row. And we, we meant to come in and discuss that and the criteria that, that you have to reach and so forth. So, so that's what we're coming in for. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Well Thanks deserved. And and we'll have the fine silver uh, waiting for you when you come in. <laughs> fine silver. <laughs> Much appreciated. That's better than the plastic with it that I normally use. <laughs> well, you'd be lucky to get plastic even. So. Well, it's going to be the fine silver for us is the plastic that looks like silver. You get that in Costco and those big boxes. Yeah, yeah, the, the it looks like one, silver. You know, you've reached, yeah, you've reached another level when you get the clear plastic spoons and forks that are regular size. What mm-hmm. they're telling you is they're expecting you or we're expecting you to bring food. <laughs> well, that'd be something, huh? Well, that's a possibility, too. You win an award and you bring us food. That seems backwards, doesn't it? Well, yeah. And you'll well, be. No, you're, you're giving us a platform to, to talk about ourselves. So may, maybe we can make that happen. And since this is on TV 10, will you be wearing your appropriate morning dress, your tuxedo? Now, I don't know about a tuxedo. I do own a tuxedo, though. It's been a long time since oh. I've worn it, but I do own a tuxedo. I do not own a tuxedo. How about you, John? I do. I do. Mr. Stubblefield? Yes, a uniform and civilian. I have to. And again, one of these things is not like the other. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it? Do you know? But everything, as far as tuxedos are concerned, I I watched American Idol last night, and the formal attire is is being downgraded significantly in, yeah. in recent years, and even down to black tie being a tuxedo but not a black tie. I see that a lot. Mm-hmm. So. Which, and I don't have a complaint. I've got a big neck, so the less I have to wear a tie, the better. Yeah. I don't think locally there's anywhere, any large function, that a tuxedo is now required. As recently, five, six, seven years ago, at the hospice big event, uh, they it was a black tie event. But now no one wears a formal dress. Last time I wore a tuxedo was the last time I was in a wedding. Yeah. That goes back a few years. Was that your own? Mm, no, I was, I was in uh, Dino Travato's wedding out in California. I had to uh, to get a tux for that, and that was the last wedding I was in. I think. I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil let's, let's talk money. Yes, sir. And uh, let's do it. So my biggest question to you right now is with this debt ceiling stress. 
uh, out there. How much of that is affecting uh, the uh, the Dow, the S and P, the Nasdaq? Um, I'm going to say very little, but I did. I I just heard this morning while I was at the gym. I did hear this this morning, and and I kind of agree with it strongly because I don't know how to to say it. I don't want to say it doesn't matter because it does matter. But what it's doing to our markets right now is very little. I mean, look at last week. We had more concerns, I think, anyway. The overall consensus of concern last week was worse than it is right now. And we had a really good week. So Jeremy Siegel, who and I completely agree with what his what his perception was, is that we're more concerned, and the the markets as a whole are more concerned with getting caught holding the bag when they come to an agreement. Now, some of that doesn't make sense if we're saying, hey, this doesn't, it's not impacting the market at all up to this point. Then what you're insinuating is that our markets would jump once they come to an agreement. And I do kind of agree with that. On the day that they come to an agreement, that our markets will jump. Now, there's, this, there's also the House and Senate that it has to go through. So in a way, there's not a whole lot of rush until the Senate meets, I think it is, the day after Memorial Day, I think. Don't, don't hold me to that. But the House before that and then the Senate right after that. So it's going to be a last-minute thing, even if they came to an agreement today before it's actually official. But what his perception is is that we're, we're more afraid of losing out on a good 2 to 3% jump, and, and that was his words, not mine, than what we are of them actually exceeding the debt limit and going, going into default. So that could have a, a huge impact. Either way, and I, again, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but at the moment, our markets as a whole are just kind of rolling our eyes going, yeah, they're going to come to an agreement. We already know that. And then we get back to the basics of the Federal Reserve and inflation and corporate earnings. Corporate earnings mean something again, and for, for quite some time it really didn't. It was more their forward-looking guidance. And the jobs number, and I also agreed with this portion of his thought, is that the job the job numbers right now are more important than what the CPI, PPI, and the PCE numbers that come in, the personal consumption numbers that come in, that the job numbers are more important than those at the moment, simply because we see this continued trajectory down. But what we, the sticky part is the job numbers, and we do need to see a little bit anyway of weakness in that and this new job market that we have. Phil, going back to the uh, debt ceiling, uh, there's there's an expectation uh, that we, they're going to come to an agreement because the expectation is they've done it every year for the last many, many, many years. Uh, should they not come to an agreement after a few weeks' time, they still have not come to an agreement. Is the insider such as you, do you still have, do you have the view like uh, Yalen and others have that the market's going to totally collapse? Uh, or is that a very extreme position that is taken? Not, I'm not going to use the word scare tactics, but in some degree, it is a scare tactic. Well, on one hand, you know, they, and I'm not, I'm certainly not an insider, but the, uh, the, the, the word totally collapse is how you define that. You know, if we had a 10% drop in two or three days, is that defined as a completely collapse? I, I don't know. Some would say yes, that's a complete collapse. And some others would just kind of blow it off. But it would certainly impact our market in a negative way. But the overall belief is, and look back to, I think it was 2011, yep. where they downgraded our credit and we ended up with a 17% drop in our markets. But look at that from that period moving forward. And we gained it all back, and it, and it all came back. So it is, it is a temporary sort of thing that doesn't have, as, as Rob told me a long time ago with, with the COVID numbers, when I was still kind of blowing the COVID numbers off, he said, I think this has legs. If it, it, I don't think that the, the debt ceiling, even if it went past the day, I don't think it has legs, and it, simply meaning that we would gain it back fairly quickly. So, and, and again, we're, we're, we are kind of rolling our eyes at this, going, yeah, we've been here, done this. This is empty threats from, from both sides. We're not, we're not going to exceed that. And maybe because of the partisanship now that maybe – Maybe it happens. I don't know, but it's been quite some time, so I don't know what our reaction would be to it, but I do believe whatever that reaction would be, it would be short-lived. We tend to group the economy and the market together. and We do. When one moves. Is that the appropriate thing we should do, or should we be no. looking at these two separate items? They, well, the, oh, they're, they're related. They're related, yeah. 
they are re- they are related but distant. Yeah. And, but so and and the reason being is our market is a forward looking measure. And we have to keep this in mind. And our economic data that we get is back is backward looking. So when we get CPI and PPI and and consumer behavior and and how to consume consumer confidence numbers, that's all looking back. And our markets are looking forward. So our markets are always, so there's a disconnect between the two. And oftentimes you see the economy in the world. And there's a the, the greatest example I can think of. And it is recent, is April of 2020. Look at what our economy looked like in that moment, and look what our stock market was doing. And, and I can't think, and although it was short-lived, I can't think of a time when our unemployment was around 20%. And it was even difficult to gauge because it was happening so fast and everybody was getting sent home. And it took quite some time for us to get back to where it is now. But all the while, what did our stock market do other than rally? It just went up. So our stock market looks forward, not backward. Economic data is looking backward, not forward. So there's a disconnect. And it, it does matter. Of course, what, the, what, the, what happens to the economy does matter. But when we get economic reports, we're more likely to reset than we are to actually react off of it. We can say, oh, well, we're right or wrong. You look at an individual company. If we, if we perceive that an individual company is, go- is going to do very well or poorly based off of the actual circumstances that we're dealing with, and then they report earnings, and it's the exact opposite. Well, it's just a reset. That's all that is. We'll reset, listen to the forward guidance, and then move forward. So there is a, a connection, but there's a disconnect as well. So it, it is. It, you can't just say, hey, look, the economy looks really good right now, so therefore the market's going to go up. Or the economy's looking really bad right now, so therefore the market's going to go down. That would be accurate, and you would be missing the mark quite often if you did that. I'm not as optimistic that this the debt ceiling – uh, crisis is going to be resolved without an actual default. And here's why. I, the McCarthy, after, what, 18 ballots or whatever it is that it took him to be elected, he's held captive by the far right in, in his caucus. He cannot blink. And Biden, well, I don't think Biden knows what he's thinking, but, but, the, but, his, <laughs> but his handlers are, are on, on the far left. They've, they've built this uh, prison, Greg Gutfeld calls it prison of two, of, of two ideas. Neither one of them can blink and not lose significant face. So if, God forbid, I am wrong and this happens and the markets tank, whatever number that is, as a financial advisor, are you calling your clients and saying bye, bye, bye nope. as, from the bottom? Nope. 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 Because, you know, we go back to this asset allocation for us specific individual when we look at and this is just how we do business I'm not saying this is how everyone should or does business but we're looking at the long-term projections for everyone that's here because we're financial planners you know we're, we're planning out the future so we know that any any movement whether it's daily monthly quarterly or even annually is short term so each individual has an asset allocation that's appropriate for them as far as equities are concerned as far as cash holdings and bonds everyone's kind of like a snowflake in a way and they look different in current economic conditions or current stock market movements aren't a part of that equation the part of the equation is the long-term growth long-term can i sustain a fall of five to ten percent and still do well or ten or fifteen percent whatever it may be it's all on the long term and almost none of this stuff impacts what's going to happen 10 to 20 to 30 years for someone because remember we're planning for a lifetime not just for that date that you retire and if you need that money within the next three to six months it should be in cash anyway so you're not subject to that sort of thing so if you're looking at paying for college or paying off a home or buying a car and you need a lump sum or a stream of income that money should be on the sidelines anyway what we've got invested is for the long long haul and when i say long haul i don't mean a year I'm talking about long term, and then from the from the standpoint of portfolio construction, well, that's done by portfolio managers. You know, we spend the majority of our day talking to people about when to turn on their social security, and hey, what's this? Do you have a health issue going on here or there, or is there an inheritance coming, or a, a lump sum of cash? You got an expense coming up, or a trip planned? All these types of life things that we can control. 
let's look at your taxes. A lot of financial planners don't do that. I can't understand how in the world you can give someone financial advice and not know where they land in the tax world, but most don't. But we always do. That's kind of the basis that, that we use when we're giving people advice on how to invest, what's it going to do to you tax-wise, what movements can we make. And none of that includes daily, monthly, quarterly, or even annual returns. None of that includes that. Uh, we know that we can't control that, but we can control some of these other things. If we know that, that John's got money that he's, he's got to spend within the next six months, we're going to put that all on the sidelines or we're going to do something much, much less aggressive with it so that when you need it, it's not at risk. So that the deck that you planned on putting putting up on your house that you had 30000 put aside, oh, now you got to reduce the square footage simply because they didn't come to an agreement on the debt ceiling and you lost a bunch of money. So now we've got twenty grand. So have fun. Go, go, go get your smaller deck. We would have put that aside anyway. So, no, we, we won't be calling people saying – buy or sell based off of, of any any of that. Now, when John asked that question, Phil, uh, this is for clarification, uh, I assumed he was saying, would you B-U-I, B-U-I. You could have, he could have been asking, would you be saying B-Y-E, B-Y-E, bye-bye. <laughs> no, it was, it was the, the, the mother of all, purchase, of all, of all buying opportunities. <laughs> no, what, now, the word that would be different, John, is if someone had just deposited money and they're sitting in cash and not quite sure what to do, and, and we haven't really gone over an asset allocation. That happens occasionally where you take on a client, but you don't know them or their situation well enough quite yet to invest the money, so it is just sitting in cash. We need to know someone before because we're, we're, we're fiduciaries, right? So I just can't say, hey, let's take your million dollars and, and, and invest it based off of where I think you should be. We got to know about you. We got to know about your health and your spouse's health and your children and your grandchildren. And is there, do you have any debts? We need to know all of that before we go invest in your money. And then no part of that equation is what's the market look like today or what has the market looked like in the past quarter or the past month. But if someone is sitting on a bunch of cash and we say, hey, man, we just we just need you to meet because we need permission to invest your money, and it's a bunch of cash and the markets just went down 10 or 15 percent, that may be the case where we're called like, hey, can you please get in here or please have a conversation with us? Because right now, once you, it's better to put it in when it's low than when it's high, of course, and right now is a good opportunity. So that's where we would be doing that. But as far as the asset allocation as a whole, the portfolio of construction wouldn't change yeah, it often occurs to me that uh, people in your position as a financial advisor, yeah, you got to have all that financial knowledge, but you've also got to be psychologists and marriage counselors. So, the, yeah. <laughs> well, to to an extent, because you can hear someone say, "I want to make as much money as I can," and then the very second it goes down one percent, the next thing out of your mouth is, "I can't handle losing any more money." I was like, "Well, those two those two statements don't go hand in hand with you," and you do you have to dig down into that. Ultimately, with our financial planning, we're putting in possibilities. We say, okay, let's look at standard deviation. Let's look at how this portfolio is built. And I know this is also boring. It excites John and myself. But let's look at standard deviation and the probable outcomes over a certain period of time. And when we look at those probable outcomes, we pay close attention to the downside of those outcomes. And if that downside, once we plug it into your financial plan, if and when those downsides happen, and they do happen, does that mean that this client can't do what they need to do or what they had hoped to do? And if the answer is yes, then we're too aggressive. We need to increase that downside. But we also know when we increase the downside, we decrease the upside, right? So then we look at the upside or the average return, the probability, and, and all these things that I like to geek out on. And can they complete their goals? Can they pay for their children's education or their grandchildren's ed education or leave that church to slump some or whatever it may be that they have planned? Can they go on the annual trip to Disney with their family? We have some people that do things like that. If, if we don't get enough return, and that answer is no. Maybe you have to only go every other year. And, and that's where the conversation really starts is, hey, look, we, we've got, we're spending too much for the way this allocation is not because you're going to run out of money now, but because you could run into an issue if and when these bad things happen. So we need to tailor it back a little bit. We need to spend less on these vacations. Instead of going to Disney, let's go to Busch Gardens, or let's go every other year, or let's not take the in-laws or something 
to to decrease that spending. And again, none of that is factored in as far as what the current market's doing right now. None of it. It is just simply based off of long-term projections and probability and all of these things that I kind of geek out about. What is your long-term projection number? When you're talking to, to a new client or an existing client and they're planning out 20 years, 30 years, um, I have heard, I, I believe Dave Ramsey's number who comes on his, his show is right after this one. Um, his, he talks about a aggregate 10 percent annual return on on the market when writ large you know when you plan out what's your number on that well it, and again it depends if you're just talking about the market itself you know we we allow projections to do that for us and on the equity side that's about accurate because you know anywhere from eight to ten percent and then we look at the bond side but when you throw in diversification on equities we're not just talking about only the s p but we're also talking about mid caps and small caps and foreign equities and how much cash are we holding. But on the aggregate with equities, it's anywhere from eight to ten percent. Now, the the amount of those equity holdings a client is holding is dependent upon their situation. You know, some are. I have, and quite honestly, and this sometimes people look at us sideways. Of our most aggressive clients are normally the oldest. And it's like, well, why in the world would your most aggressive clients be the oldest of us? Well, because they've got money that we know that they're never going to use. So now we're investing for who they're leaving that money to. And if they're leaving that money to a grandchild, which is often the case, or grandchildren or children that's much younger than them, then we need to invest that based off of their goals and their timeline. So therefore, you know, you have a 90-year-old that's not spending any money, and their, their portfolio just grows year after year after year. And we know that they're not going to be alive in 30 years. We kind of know that, right? We don't predict people's death, but we kind of know that. Common sense tells us. So, so therefore, we're more aggressive for that client than what we would be maybe for a 65-year-old that just retired. So it is a little different because their, their outcome, we're not quite sure, right? 65, you're going to live another 30, 40 years. We won't let you tell us anything. But So we're going to invest that as if you need this stream of income. And then we can change that allocation as we see what you look like in retirement and what your expenses are. Sometimes you say, hey, I'm not going to spend as much in retirement, and then you do. Or I'm going to spend more than what you actually do. There's always people sometimes they're wrong in their estimates of what their requirements will be. So we, we will kind of step into it. We'll just dip our toe in the water a little bit and then figure out exactly what this client's life looks like uh, upon that change of retirement. Phil, we are just about out of time, as they say in Canada. Uh, final word on how people can get in touch with you for more information. You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and say it's within an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue, right here in Marksburg. Phil, I will talk to you again tomorrow morning at 638, sir. I will be there with bells on. You guys have a good one. Thank you, Phil. Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriads Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg.